to start with actually what the process is and, and what the farm bill is that we have in place. We use this term kind of loosely for this package of stuff uh, that we have coming around about every five years. Um, it's sometimes a little longer than that, but um, usually every five years is what we're shooting for. It is a piece of legislation that at its core is amending other pieces of legislation and sometimes adding new legislation to the package as well. It's also what's called an omnibus bill, and that's just a big and fancy term, meaning that we're packaging a whole bunch of bills into one thing, and we're passing it uh, in a single stroke through Congress. So the omnibus nature of this means that we've got a whole lot of stuff going on uh, that's being passed at a single point in time. We have uh, permanent legislation that was put in place um, many, many years ago. Some of it starts back as far as the 1920s, but uh, I think that the first real major piece of legislation that we refer back to, especially for dairy, was the Agricultural Act of 1949. And that gives us some permanent piece of legislation that we're actually amending, or in most cases here, putting into hiatus because we don't want it to be active anymore. But it still exists. And if we don't have a new farm bill right here um, and we don't amend it, some of those old programs that we have clear back from that uh, early act come back into play. And you may remember in years past as we've gotten towards the end of a farm bill and into the first uh, few months um, after a farm bill has expired that we often start to talk about the dairy cliff. And the dairy cliff that people refer to means that uh, with something like this 1949 Act, we would have price supports become active once again, and those price supports are at a level that was established back in 1910. And uh, milk price at that time leveraged up to this point in time with the uh, cost of production uh, would be considerably higher than they are today. So this becomes kind of the Damocles sword that hangs over Congress and lets them know you better do something because if you don't, we have to invoke um, what is there in the permanent legislation. There's other important agricultural legislation that's also permanent. The Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938 and the Marketing Agreements Act of 1937 uh, both have um, pieces of legislation that are permanent and are active for dairy as well. And what uh, our current farm bills will do is to either revise some of these um, permanent pieces of legislation, um, but they have to be explicit in there. If we don't have any new legislation passed, then the programs either just expire, and that would be a program like the Margin Protection Program, because that was put into place in the last farm bill and has been active, continues to be active, but at the end of the calendar year, margin protection program would ex expire if it doesn't get extended. Um, other programs, however, uh, might become activated as part of our permanent law out here, like the Dairy Product Price Support Program. Um, as I just uh, offer an opinion down here, it could be very ugly. The reason is that the uh, current parity prices, which are published monthly in the Agricultural Prices Report, um, would suggest that the parity price for milk is something like $52 a hundredweight right now. So if the government was trying to achieve $52 a hundredweight by buying as much dairy product as it took to get there, that would be ugly. It would probably make uh, that stash of powder over in uh, the European Union look small. Um, these are the primary pieces of legislation that we have in place that I'm going to call dairy policy today. I'm going to go back to the first one that we don't often think about perhaps, but it was 1921 when we passed the Capper-Volstead Act. Uh, this was an important act for agriculture in general, but dairy as well, um, because at that time we had a lot of concerns about monopolies that were pricing uh, various things like petroleum and steel in the United States, railroads, 
that were operating as monopolies, and we had a lot of trusts that were being busted at that point in time. Cooperatives <coughs> were working together. They were trying to form themselves for the purposes, of course, of enhancing prices, but they didn't know where they stood with regard to this antitrust legislation. Capper Volstead was that piece of legislation that spells out what cooperatives can do, and it does at least hint at that fuzzy line where you can cross over that and uh, become price enhancing to the point that uh, even cooperatives shouldn't be going there. So uh, Capper Volstead is an important piece of legislation. The Marketing Agreements Act of 1937 was the act that gave us um, milk marketing orders. They were agreements, first of all. They weren't orders. They were agreements. And then they became milk marketing orders. But um, they were executed to create more orderly markets and marketing and to protect farmers from the processing power that had been accumulated into um, dairy processors. And they added some leverage out there of value-added beverage milk market. So that was an important piece of legislation that's still in place today. The Agricultural Act of 1949 was the thing that gave us the dairy price support program. And our grandfathers or great-grandfathers were the ones that were experiencing a lot of price volatility too. At that point in time, it wasn't unusual to have milk prices moved by as much as 150% um, over the course of a year. Um, this was seasonal swings in prices. It wasn't the uh, cyclical swings that we see now that are roughly every three years, um, plus or minus some number. But the dairy price support program was actually built on the concepts and ideas that Land Lakes put together that said, you know, if we could just own a piece of surplus um, dairy product from the marketplace for a period of time. In other words, take it off during the spring flush when we have too much milk um, and then sell it back to the market in the fall when we're short and tight. We could help to level some of these price swings and volatility. And the dairy uh, product price support program um, picked that idea up and did exactly that. And that program is still in place today but put into hiatus. If you're going to have a program like that where the government stands ready and willing to buy all of the dairy products that anybody wants to sell to them at specified prices, then you have to think just a little bit about how do we make sure that we don't become inundated with product from overseas. And so even though we've never really had much trouble with that thinking about it back in the 1950s, we realized that we probably needed to have some quota values in place. Um, so we did have dairy import quotas that were put into place in the 1951 Act, and they were later replaced by uh, tariff rate quotas um, under the Uruguay round of agreements. And we still have those active, as well as other trade pacts, such as um, um, well, our, our most recently <coughs> announced renegotiation of uh, what had been NAFTA and is now the U.S., Mexico, and Canada Act. Um, we also have programs um, in place, such as the uh, Margin Protection Program. This was just put in place in the last Farm Bill, 2014. Um, even though our Farm Bill has technically expired, this program would still be active through the end of the year. So if we had um, margin payments that would uh, be made or would be required to be made during November, December, that kind of time period, it would still make those without doing anything else. But it would expire after that. This is the kind of timeline that we're looking at. In June 21st of this year, the House narrowly passed their version of a farm bill. This, of course, was crafted in the Agricultural uh, Committee of the House first and then brought to the House floor, had debate, some amendments uh, were discussed and a couple added. But by a vote of 213 to 211, it was narrowly passed. Much, uh, much of this was along the lines of, of uh, partisan uh, politics in the House. The Senate was much more bipartisan in their passage of the bill. 
Um, in fact, it passed by 86 to 11, and they passed that version on June 27th. Um, I will also just suggest to you that historically, the Farm Bill has been a piece of legislation that has enjoyed broad bipartisan support. This is one of the places where um, an entangled Congress can often get together and agree that this is a package we ought to do. This year, we are seeing a bit more in the way of partisan politics, even with um, something like the Farm Bill. Uh, but we're in the process right now of having two versions of the bill passed out of this House and Senate, and now we have to go back in and uh, find where those differences are in the bills and uh, come to some kind of agreement. This is done in a conference committee. The conferees have been named. They've actually held the first of those committees on September 5th, and although we don't have the committee reporting the bill back out at this point in time, um, we uh, will continue the conference committee until that happens. Um, the current law that uh, we had actually technically expired with the end of the fiscal year on September 30th. So our farm bill, as we knew it, expired. If you take a look at what's the real stumbling block, why the House is uh, having so much of partisan politics in the way, it comes down to the food and nutrition programs that are part of the farm bill. This is where there are some major differences between uh, uh, what uh, Republicans would like to see in the way of changes to a program and what the Democrats really don't want to have um, very such, such large changes made, I guess. So this is where the stumbling block is, and the House really wants some strengthened work requirements for SNAP recipients. Let me just give you an idea, if you take a look at a map about um, the number of people, or the percent of the population that we have on uh, some kind of food assistance. Um, the lighter colored states, the kind of buff colored ones there in the uh, Great Plains and Upper Midwest area are states that have the least number of uh, food uh, uh, recipients, a SNAP benefit recipients, and those are less than 8%, or just about 8% of population receiving those. The darkest green states are more than 16% of the population receiving some kind of nutritional assistance. So I think you can see that it does actually impact quite a lot of people, but it's not the same in all regions of the country. I wanted to uh, just give you some idea about where all of this kind of argument about spending on programs like this actually falls into the spending pie of the United States. So I thought I'd start with a big picture and we'll drill down a little bit after that. This is showing you for the US federal government budget what it is that we spend money on. The biggest piece of that pie is right over here, it's 24%, and that's for Social Security, okay? So that's not food and assistance, that's Social Security. This second largest piece of the pie is 18%, and that's Medicare spending. So the two of these things are going to be things that I'm aspiring to <laughs> in the not too distant future, but that's a pretty big chunk of the pie. I'd also mention that these blue colored um, wedges that we have out here are what's called mandatory spending, which means that the government really must spend money on these programs because they're authorized by law to pay whatever it is they need to pay under those programs. The discretionary spending we have is up here in these uh, red to pink colored slices. The biggest one of these is 12% and that's for defense spending. Um, the other discretionary spending we have that's also 12% uh, just is a whole category of things, just a lot of different things. Interest is this other green um, line over here. And you know, our national debt's big enough, we obviously have to pay a fair amount of interest. This bigger slice here is also 9% for Medicaid. So health care between Medicaid and Medicare is a pretty good chunk of the pie too. I point all this out because these little wedges over here are what we're talking about now in our farm bill. These are the programs that are gonna be covered here. The biggest piece shown up on this, 
which amounts to 1.3% of the federal budget, are actually the food and nutrition programs, the SNAP programs. The rest of this little slice that we can hardly see in here are the farm safety net and conservation programs. So in the big spending picture, Farm Bill is less than 2% in total of all expenditures. So let's drill down, just take a look at that uh, wedge of the Farm Bill itself. These are the projected outlays um, for the 2014 Farm Bill over its lifetime um, that we are currently under and it just recently expired. The Congressional Budget Office plays an important role in all of this and they're the ones that get to project what the expenditures are going to be over the life of the Farm Bill. And uh, the total outlays that were forecast or projected for this last Farm Bill, the 2014 Farm Bill, were $489 billion, 80% of which are the food and nutrition programs. Okay, so that's a big chunk of money, but food and nutrition is by far the biggest piece of that. Conservation programs amount to about another 6%. Crop insurance, about 8%. Um, other programs, and there are a handful of them, 1%. And right in here are the commodities programs, and that's where dairy sits, or at least most of dairy. So, did you have questions? Okay, sure, take it now. Yep. And I realize we need the nutritional amount, but why are we, why have we just always been that way that we combine the food stamp program with the farm bill? Yeah, I, uh, I'd have to go back to remind myself when food and nutrition actually got started as part of an addition, but it was an addition to the farm bill because it was felt that it, it was food and it was a program. This must be our alert. Oh, that's not alert. Yes, so. It, for those of you who might possibly not know, Donald Trump is giving us the ultimate tweet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. The palm's already been dropped, so we're going anyway. So <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. But is this it logical is, to you that, that, that they should? Is it is it logical? This is a this is an important question. Um, a lot of people would say no, it isn't. In fact. Wouldn't it be easier if we just took all the controversy, those food and nutrition programs, and get them out of here? On the other hand, <laughs> if I played devil's advocate for a moment, there are plenty of people who would say, wait a minute, this is the program that a whole lot of Congress actually, whoops, actually cares about. Okay, so this is where you bring people to the table and you can get them to talk about farm programs and pass these things. If we only had a farm program, that doesn't impact very many people in the U.S. anymore. Sorry to say, we're a small proportion of the total. But a lot of people are food insecure, and uh, you know this kind of helps us, I think, uh, bring a lot of this into discussion. And so we, had pe we have had people who've said these should be separated. There are more people that say, politically, we're better off keeping them together. I'm not going to put uh, my ore in that uh, water. <laughs> uh, it's more important whether you agree or not. <laughs> and uh, call your congressman. Uh, but that's what we have today. Sure. Uh, those are your words. <laughs> this gives cooperatives the right to get together so to they bargain pay, for they don't a. Have to pay the federal order. They can pay under, but that's not what Capra Falls said gives them the so right to do. <laughs> okay, well we'll uh, we'll talk about some of these things perhaps at the end. Um, so the commodities are where dairy is going to be looking at its piece of the action. Recognize this is also where ARC and PLC exist, um, and this is where the biggest chunk of, of the commodity slice is going to be in the crop side, not in the dairy side. Dairy is a small piece of that. All right, so as I mentioned, there's a funny kind of accounting that goes on 
when we're trying to look at passing a farm bill and we're talking about and debating whether we can afford a program for dairy or not and you know those kinds of things it doesn't matter what the program actually costs okay that's an important thing to understand it's what the congressional budget office estimates that the program will cost so last year and, and not last year last farm bill in all of their talk discussion and estimation they came up with a number that said $489 billion was what the farm bill was going to cost. As it turns out, they update those estimates every year. The most recent estimate is that it's only going to cost us $455 billion. Still sounds like a pretty good chunk of change to me, but remember, on our national budget for everything else, this is just a tiny piece of the pie out here. And God bless CBO. Um, I'm an economist, but if they came to me and said, I want you to estimate, estimate what the cost of the farm bill would be, wow, that is a big, tall task to do. That's not an easy thing to do. They have people who work in all the different commodity areas and understand the food and nutrition areas, all the rest of it, and they do their best estimate. So this actual underspending that we did uh, came from $26 billion out of the SNAP program that was not as expensive as was anticipated. $10 billion less was spent on crop insurance than they forecast, $5 billion less for conservation, but they actually spent about $13 billion more for commodity and disaster payments. So there are going to be differences between what you budgeted and what you actually ended up spending. So when the farm bill expires, there are a few things that are going to happen. There are a few programs that are going to cease to operate unless they're reauthorized. And Congress can do that, and occasionally they will. There are some programs, though, like the SNAP programs, for example, that they can keep going by giving appropriations, which means that Congress would have to go in and say, we authorize spending for this purpose. So the, the uh, program may not be activated as a result of the new farm bill yet because it hasn't been passed, but we'll still keep the machinery and the mechanism and uh, uh, the money flowing through that through appropriations. But the farm commodity programs not only expire, but they would revert back to permanent legislation. So um, by the time we get to January, you know, we can start talking about whether or not we're going to be invoking the parity prices for milk. Um, I think that that's highly unlikely, but, um, you know, we can, we can understand that that's a pressure point for them. There are some other programs, though, like crop insurance that has permanent authority. And uh, that permanent authority under the crop insurance program means it doesn't need a farm bill to reauthorize it you would have to actually pass a new bill to retract that and take it away. So even if the farm bill doesn't get passed, uh, crop insurance uh, programs keep going. Two types of spending out here, as I mentioned before, there's mandatory spending on programs. The vast majority of the farm bill is mandatory spending. That means that once they authorize it, it doesn't matter what it actually costs, you're going to spend the money. Um, it's like the MPP program. We actually had uh, several years where we paid more in the way of premiums into that program than we got out. But in a year like this last year, uh, this current year, I mean, we've received quite a lot more money out of that program than was put into it in the way of premiums. Uh, that said, it doesn't matter how many millions or billions of dollars they would spend on a program like that. Congress has mandated it, it's authorized spending, and we would pay whatever we had to pay uh, to satisfy that program. It's not like a certain dollar amount that you can spend and then you're all done. So the nutrition, crop insurance, conservation, commodities, all of that are mandatory programs. That's 99% of the cost of the entire farm bill. Only 1% is discretionary spending. And under discretionary spending here, um, we have a few programs like trade, horticulture, energy, 
research. There's a, more than uh, programs they have, but a handful of them, but they don't amount to a lot of dollars in total. But those are discretionary. So uh, with discretionary programs, uh, Farm Bill can pass those kind of programs. And we've done that with some frequency. You know, Congress says, we think that this is a good idea. Um, let's go ahead and, and we will pass those, um, authorizing them. But w they actually never get put into place because when we get down to appropriations, money is never um, identified out of a budget to fund those programs. So they're on the books, they could be used, but we have no money for it, so they don't get uh, started. That happens occasionally. Let me give you some idea about those <coughs> mandatorily funded programs. And remember, this is 99% of the spending that happens in a farm bill under the four mandatory areas, nutrition assistance, crop insurance, farm and commodity and conservation. The green line down here, the green bars, are the conservation programs. And I think you can see that they've been modestly growing over time. Um, so if you go back to 1990 till today, they have grown a little bit in spending, not a lot. If you take a look at the food and nutrition programs, they've grown a lot. Um, so uh, this was relatively small amount of spending back here in the 1990s. Today, this is big. And what do you notice about the nutrition spending programs in there when you look at that graph? Anything? Yeah, it's big. It's, it's, as Larry said, about four times everything else. The other thing that I notice is that from here to here, we had a really big increase. And it stayed big since that time period. That was 2009. That was our recession that we had, the Great Recession. And there were a lot of people that fell into food insecurity during that time period. And we have not pulled all of those people back and off of this role. I think this is part of why Congress is looking at this, in the House especially, and saying, we got to do something. We got to trim this thing back. It's getting big. Now, you can also notice that there's a little up and down in here, but crop insurance has basically grown over time. The only program area that really hasn't grown and, in fact, has contracted are the farm commodities. Those are the ones where programs like MPP exist. So those have shrunk rather considerably over the years. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, uh, what we can do now. Congress has basically been very interested in the last several years and in the previous Farm Bill of trying to harmonize the dairy programs, trying to make them look more like the crop programs and other things that we had. That's partially why we got MPP, partially. Um, the MPP program looked a whole lot more like ARC PLC, the uh, crop programs out there. And if you're trying to think about what is it that farmers can do to deal with some of the risk management or safety net issues, these are the things up here that farms can and, and do do quite often um, in dealing with risk. One thing they can do is nothing. You know, we can say basically, um, you know, I don't like this volatility and these low years are horrible, but you know, I can probably get through them. I'm going to self-insure. I'm going to do nothing. If we don't like that, there are opportunities to cash contract with a co-op or a plant um, for milk prices. They aren't always there, but um, in many cases they are. Um, we have the futures markets that are available to do hedging or uh, purchase options or sell options. So there are some things we can do there um, with what the marketplace is, is providing. And occasionally there are swaps that are available for more sophisticated farms too. These things down here, are three programs that we have that the Farm Bill makes possible for us. One of them is LGM Dairy. Um, that is under the crop insurance umbrella. Uh, LGM Dairy has been with us for a good many years now. Um, it has been used, uh, but never really, I would say, achieved escape velocity. Um, there are some farms that use it with some regularity, but not all the time. We have a new kit on the block, hasn't actually gone on sale yet, but again, 
that comes under the crop insurance banner too. And that's this new dairy revenue protection uh, program. And dairy RP is something that actually goes on sale here October 9th. Remember, crop insurance is permanent, it's <laughs> mandatory, and you don't need to pass a farm bill in order to have um, dairy revenue protection um, coming on board. That's just something we can do anytime we wanted to. And so this is a new program that would become available for risk management purposes. Not a bad program either, in my opinion. As I look at it, I think it offers some things we don't um, often get. But if you think it's going to bail you out of low prices like we have right now, it won't. Because if the futures markets are not of the opinion that higher prices are warranted, they won't be available <coughs> to protect on the farm. Right? That's kind of what these are doing. They're, they're looking to futures and options market for the guidance as to what should be offered. Um, but nevertheless, a good program. Um, MTP Dairy has had a lot of controversy since it was conceived of and implemented in the last Farm Bill. Um, that falls under the commodity and disaster um, wedge of the pie. And that program, I'll give them some slack. I think that we've been irritated by it because it wasn't as effective. It didn't make payments when we felt like we wanted them or needed them. But honestly, it's a difficult thing to do to start a new program like that and to try to know with that kind of program what's actuarially fair. There are going to be, what, 75,000 people here at this dairy expo. And a few of us uh, on the way home sometime are going to have maybe a little fender bender. Um, but you know, uh, auto insurance companies can calculate what the likelihood of that event happening is because one or two of us might have that event, the rest of us won't. We can understand what the cost is to be actuarially fair. But with things like milk prices and feed prices moving around, you gotta understand that all of those boats are rising and falling on the same tide out here. It's not like one farm has a bad accident and the rest of them don't. We have to try to understand how likely is it uh, that we're going to trigger a payment under MTP Dairy. So that's a program that's probably needed some work. We got a sampling of that this last year when they went back in and said, we're gonna start over um, this last year of the farm bill. We're going to offer it at greatly reduced premiums and in fact, in hindsight for it. There are quite a few titles or chapters of the farm bill. The last one had 12 chapters out there and they come under such things as commodity price, income supports, farm credit. Uh, that includes both FSA as well as farm credit as we know it. Um, trade, ag, conservation, so forth. And the interesting omnibus nature of a farm bill means that we sometimes get some unusual folks that may be standing with us in coalition. Um, you might remember, was it two or three years ago I remember how long, <laughs> they all start to blend after some point in time. But the Sierra Club became quite active in the Farm Bill discussion. Sierra Club, well that was unusual. But they were interested in conservation programs and wanted to have an impact there. So occasionally uh, we get some folks coming into a Farm Bill that we don't really think about too much. For us though, this Title I is the place where most of the action is. And that's where the dairy specific programs like MPP are located. So let's talk about MPP. We've had a bill passed out of both the House and the Senate. And uh, there are some known things that these programs want to do. The very first of which they agree upon, not exactly the name change, but they both agree we need a name change. MPP is toxic. Um, dairy farmers are mad at it. And so we're going to take this program we're going to make some major changes to it and we're going to call it something else because we don't want you to think it's the same old program. Uh, the House would say we're going to call it Dairy Risk Management Program or DRMP. The Senate would say let's call it Dairy Risk Coverage or DRC. So that worked that out. Not a big deal. They're going to keep the same idea though about production history. That's not updated. That's not changed. 
You're still going to go back to the highest milk production that was achieved in 2011, 12, or 13. Um, you can still sign up for this program mm -hmm. even if you hadn't the previous one. So uh, it's that production history over that time period. Or if you've got a new facility or you're new to dairying since um, that 2013 year, then um, you have me other mechanisms for establishing a production history. Both the House and the, the Senate version would get rid of the uh, milk percentage that we, or that we cover. Not get rid of it per se. They'd change the parameters. Right now it says you have to choose between 25 to 90 percent of your production <coughs> history. And both of them would let you go down, I think, to 5 percent in 5 percent increments. So what this means is that even larger farms could ratchet down to get first 4 million pounds of milk under that tier one coverage level. So um, that would be changed. They also want to move new margins up to a $9 level, not the $8 level we currently have. So they'd put two new ones in there, $8.50 and $9. And I'll show you why that becomes important just a little bit later. Here, I think, is one of the primary differences between the House and the Senate. The House would say, you get to choose what level of coverage you want, you know, $8, $9, um, $7, $6.50, whatever it might be, and you get to choose that percentage of coverage on there one time, once, and that's in place for the whole farm bill. Okay, we, we have a forecasting tool that we use and we allow, or allow, we, uh, we have uh, FSA um, also using that tool that helps us look a little more than a year ahead to see what um, we think the forecast margins might be, but there's no way I can forecast up there five years. Not possible for me to do. The Senate would say, no, let's keep it as an annual decision. So those are two things that are quite different. Both of these have a little bit different kind of thing going on, but the premium rates would be greatly reduced from uh, what we originally had under both of them. Under the House, they're on the discounts, but under the Senate, they have a discount of 50% uh, for the premium cost for the uh, small farms. Those would be farms less than 2 million pounds of milk production and 25% for what they're calling medium-sized farms. That's between 2 million and 10 million. So they're going to discount the premiums even further uh, for different size farms. Let's give you some idea about what the premiums look like. This is what we currently have right now. Tier one, remember, the first four million pounds of milk production, historic production. Tier two is the milk above that. And as you can see, there's a tremendous difference between tier one and tier two premium prices. At the $8 level, uh, these prices, by the way, tier one were changed quite a bit this year. Uh, the tier one is currently costing $14, or $14, 14 14.2 cents. Uh, per hundred weight uh, at the $8 level and $1.36 at the tier two level. It's so different that, you know, larger farms are not wanting to protect anything under tier two if they can help it. Um, the new house version would keep most of this roughly equivalent to what we've got right now. It's actually less expensive at the tier one level here at the eight dollars nine cents versus the fourteen two, but the uh, new levels would cost up to seventeen cents to cover at nine dollar margin. The Senate um, has uh, slightly different versions of pricing. It would be eighteen cents at the nine dollar level. These are not really big differences out here. There's no change at all for the tier two pricing in the House. But the tier two here in the Senate is um, a little bit different. And, you know, they're suggesting that, in fact, our tier two prices aren't high enough. We're going to move them up even higher. <laughs> so I think that pretty well guarantees you wouldn't sell a lot there. Jim? Would it be capped for tier two then at $8? Would it be capped for tier two at $8? Um, yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's all you can do on both of those. Um, but on tier one, you can go on up to uh, $8.59. Or $9. Just to give you an idea about what does this mean, um, this means quite a lot. 
Yeah, question. Why Pete. Would you want to bring up Okay, tier one is still four million pounds of milk production, of your historic milk production, okay? So if you had eight million pounds of historic milk production and you chose the 50% coverage of that, you're now 100% at the four million pounds that you're covering, okay? Same, that hasn't changed. Um, same thing's true for the center. This is important, okay? Our $8 level of protection is shown right here, and that's where we've been. We've been getting payments this year, as you can see, all the way along through here. Here's a $9 line. At a $9 level, and this is over the life of what we've actually experienced since this was implemented in March of 2014. From 2014 until the present day, 50% of the time, we would be receiving payments under this program, 50% of the time. And if you take a look back over this time period, the payments on all milk would have averaged um, 73 cents per hundredweight. Now remember, we've got a little difference between the House and the Senate version about whether it's 17 cents or 18 cents to get that coverage, but either one of those would have been a pretty good buy. If I could spend 18 cents and get 73 cents back, I'd do that every day all day long. That's a 400% return on your investment. So they're really making this a lot more sensitive uh, than it had been before. Mind you, that is for the tier one level of coverage. Okay, doesn't include the tier two. The tier two is gonna cost a lot more than the uh, 17 to 18 cents. There have been some other changes in here too. The House wants to take a closer look at feed costs in the bill. Um, they want to evaluate the accuracy of the data. They want to begin a new survey for dairy grade alfalfa hay. Um, there's been a lot of complaints that what NAS collects is just alfalfa hay prices, not dairy grade hay. Um, under the House version of the bill, you could participate in both the MPP program and the LGM dairy at the same time but you can't cover the same milk. So um, that would just mean that those programs would be mutually exclusive. Um, there's no provision over here for doing MPP and LGM dairy at the same time in the Senate. Um, this was an addition uh, from the floor, I think put in on the bill by Kirsten Gillibrand from New York, but she wanted to make sure that we didn't have any more of those time periods when farmers had paid quite a bit in the way of premiums and got nothing back out of it. And so every year they would look at the program and say, did we take money into the US Treasury as a result of this? If so, that should be paid back to dairy farmers. So uh, that's in the Senate version of the bill. And both of these um, bills, this has nothing to do with MPP, but um, both of them would change the federal milk marketing order um, formulas for class one pricing. We currently have um, class one being priced off of the higher of class three or class four skim solids. And what they would do is to say, we'll take the average of class three and class four and add 74 cents per hundred weight. They both agree about that. That takes us back to something that historically would have been about revenue neutral, but um, it also makes it easier for processors in particular to think about basis risk because we don't have to guess whether class three or four is going to be the higher of. Yeah. On the LGM and MPP? Yeah. Um, under those programs, you could protect say, you know, 40% of your milk under um, LGM dairy, and you could protect, say, 50% uh, of your milk under MPP. You can't protect more milk than you actually um, have historic production for. On the house side. On the house side. But on the Senate side, there's a prohibition 
on the Senate side, it's it's pick a lane. <laughs> you know, it's either LGM dairy as it is now, or it's MPP, but not both. But, not both. but remember, they've got an annual choice. So one year you could do MPP dairy, and the other year you could do LGM dairy. So what's the time? Yeah, question. Is it, is it online to ask a question now? No. Bill? Okay, you showed the last photograph that you had there. You had all the you mean prices the chart? and what we would have received. The last one. There you go. Yep. Okay. What determines the actual price that's used to determine whether it's up or below? Is that the national average milk price? Yes. They use, uh, for prices, the U.S. all-milk price. The all-milk price is the best estimate that we have of what plants actually had to pay to get milk in the door of the plant. Okay, so that's adjusted for components. It's not at 3.5% milk fat. Um, it also includes premiums that were paid. That's the average milk price in the United States. In the U.S. Now, when you're 2 or $3 below that, yep. what does that do for you? Nothing. Nothing. No. Um, so, and I think it's important to understand that there's probably no farmer in the country that actually receives the U.S. all milk price. But the real question is, is it a good barometer of what's happening on dairy farms? You know, in other words, when it goes up, does your price go up? When it goes down, does your price go down? And the same thing's true for the feed prices. That margin out there doesn't have to be your margin but it needs to give you a payment when you need a payment uh, or not. Otherwise, it's an ineffective program. So once you get that established and you understand the program, then you make a decision about, do I want to be involved in this? Does it actually do something for me or doesn't it? No, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of these concerns that we have are legitimate concerns, but it's not possible to tailor a program for every individual dairy producer. All of our circumstances are different, and we have to make decisions about whether we belong in this industry, and if we do, can we make use of tools that are available to us like this? It's not to say that they're perfect, um, but it's to question about, I guess, whether or not they're useful, potentially. Uh, okay, um, so what's the timeline on this? The House and Senate have met once in conference. Um, they haven't made a lot of progress on that. The sticking point is still largely the SNAP, although some of the members of the conferees have said, oh, we think we've got that pretty well ironed out. And yet, <laughs> you know, we're not reporting anything out. Um, the conference committee really indicated they wanted to wrap it up by September 30th. That would be unusual. We seldom get a farm bill done on time. Um, we're also hearing a lot about, uh, boy, we're going to get this farm bill before the end of the year. Um, I'm just going to tell you that I'm suspicious. I don't think that's going to happen, but it could. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for getting some uh, legislation done before we actually go to the polls in November. So maybe they'll make it happen. I don't know. We'll see. But I think that the likelihood is there's a bunch of Congress that wants to get home and they want to campaign. They want to do the things they need to do to get ready for November. And there are plenty of folks that want to see what does the political calculus look like after the election? Has anything changed? You know, and if so, can I think about bringing that to the table at the first of the year? My guess is we're going to have a continuing resolution out here and that the ultimate passage is likely to be January, um, and that's actually quite normal, not unusual. So answer the original question. <coughs> does it hurt or does it help? Well, I'm going to tell you that I think that um, even though you may feel like uh, – I'm, I'm sick of that program. That MPP did nothing for me. That was bad. Um, I think you ought to look at it again. 
they're trying to fix this thing to make some significant changes. And honestly, um, I think it's just good basic risk management for farms that can consider you know, that first 4 million pounds of historic production. If you're a much larger farm, that doesn't cover your risk uh, really fully at all. And those premiums are pretty expensive in tier two. I do think though that you know, the farm bill through the crop insurance program has given life to this new program, this dairy RP. And I think that uh, we'll wanna take a look at that. Um, that's not the be all and end all either, but it's another tool in the toolbox. And it's something that uh, we can look at. And in some years, it's gonna be a fairly low cost risk management option for folks. And by the way, it can be used in conjunction with the MPP program. So farms can use both of those two things uh, at the same time, and uh, they can cover, um, you know, milk under the, the two programs. So that's what I had in the way of presentation. I would be happy to take some questions or comments uh, if you want to do that. Yes. What seems to be the problem with the SNAP program? Why it can't be abused? The biggest problem with the SNAP program right now, in my opinion, is that. Um, we've got Democrats that are worried that we'll pull nutrition programs away from people who need it still. And there are Republicans who would be saying, largely, you know, Republicans, the aisles haven't crossed too much lately, um, that, you know, some of these folks have got to get jobs and we need to have the pathway for them to encourage them toward work or at least retraining um, to get them off of programs like this. So those are two different points of view, and that's where the, uh, the real rub seems to be with the SNAP programs now. Yes? Where are the payments coming for the Where are the payments coming for the tariff subsidy program? Um, those are coming just out of general uh, treasury right now. That's not a farm bill thing. Uh, that was something that was authorized by Congress it is being administered through USDA, but that would be uh, a, a new appropriation for them, some monies that were made available. Does it come from the tariffs themselves? Does it come from the tariffs themselves? No. Regardless of what we collect in the way of uh, tariffs on any pro or product like steel or aluminum or anything else, no, this just comes out of general treasury. Where does that tariff money go? Into the general treasury. Mm -hmm. The question was, where does the tariff money go? This, MPP is the same way. You know, you write a check for the premium. This does not go to Sunny Purdue. Um, you know, this doesn't go to USDA in general. This doesn't go to Farm Service Agency. This goes into the general treasury. Poof, you know, right into the big money uh, pile. But on the other hand, when we are drawing out of that and writing checks for dairy producers, they also come out of the general treasury. It's not like um, USDA has a certain amount of budget that they can spend up to that and then the money runs out. This just keeps going. You know, we pay as much as we need to pay. It's mandated. Jim. Were they able to increase the MPP benefits because the CEO refunds you get projections on the other programs that the farm is If they are, I assume they're projecting the MPP is going to cost a whole lot more than that. Yeah, the, the uh, question is uh, from Jim, um, did we get some headspace or breathing room under MPP? I think in, in these new versions of the bill that you're talking about uh, because of changes uh, that we have here. CBO is going to do their calculations largely the same way they did them before. And so Congress has to play around a little bit understanding um, what that actually means for those calculations. I think that that's part of the reason that you saw the Senate version of the bill actually increasing tier two prices. Because under that kind of calculation, CBO would likely say, well, that's more money coming in, you know, because those, those premium costs are higher. Uh, I think the reality is probably that, you know, there'll be zero money coming in under that because producers say that's too expensive. But remember, as I said, it's not what it actually costs. It's what CBO scores the program is thinking that it will cost. Bob. Uh, Ooh. 
Do I think mar no? Uh, the question was, do I think the margin protection has contributed to surplus production? Um, I don't believe that under the bill that we've had so far and the amount of payments that have come out. Um, it has made payments. Would any of those payments be big enough to make the difference between the decision about staying in business or not? No, they've been small. Um, I'm not sure that I could say the same thing and I'm not offering an opinion right now, but we would make a lot more payments under a $9 margin um, at that kind of cost. So that could make a difference. When we've run some of the modeling in the past, and I haven't done this with the new versions of the program, but if we got into one of those persistently really low price times, um, like a 2009, you'd have been paying out buckets of money to dairy producers. And in so, in so doing, it would have insulated them from the impacts of a market that said, whoa, we don't need that much milk. So we could have gotten into a persistent cycle of producing too much. That's what the modeling shows, at least, um, when we hit one of those very low milk prices. We've been in a low milk price, but I would say it's not so much the depth of that uh, milk price as it's been the persistence of that low milk price. So most farmers would probably tell you, you know, I can get through one or two years of this, but four years, that's starting to be a real long scrape now. Yes? Um, we've been doing things like that with the crop insurance programs for decades. Um, so as long as we've had crop insurance, we've had uh, proposals that have been brought forward. The first thing that um, the crop insurance agency has to do is to look at the proposal and see if it has merit. If they think it does, then they are going to register some concerns that they have with it. Uh, the folks that are proposing it have to go back and make changes. Um, they would resubmit that. It goes through review, uh, several review boards and panels. Yeah. Isn't LGM Dairy one of those? Yes. LGM Dairy is also one of those. Mm -hmm. Mark, could you go back to the bar graph where you Sure. Yep. Right here? These are the actual payments that would have been made had you bought up at the $8 level. Okay? I mean, this is what the actual margin calculation is or was. Okay? That hasn't changed at all. You can look at, at these data on the FSA webpage and you'll see that it's precisely these numbers. So we did have some payments that were of pretty good size um, for. Or and, and by the way, I've gone back to monthlies on here because that's what we're calculating now. At the time for most of this, we had bi-monthly averages, but I showing it as monthly because that's what we do forward. Let's say you come and make a payment standpoint, whether you're in the structure of contract or term work or whatever, how do you get past the burden in this structure of one, two, three dairy if a similar program We count on good words from ag journalists. <laughs> we just quote you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pete, I think that, you know, I think that everybody's got to be suspicious about any and all of these programs. Don't go into anything just blindly. Take a look at it. See if you think it's for you. This isn't rocket science. These are calculations that anybody can do with just a little bit of algebra and the data that we have available. Um, see what it means for your farm. Um, is it worth doing? Um, how realistic do you think these kind of margins are going forward? You know, do you think we'd be getting payments? If we aren't, I would say hallelujah. I wouldn't mind paying 17 or 18 cents if my margins and milk prices were, you know, dollars above that level. I mean, that's, that's like I do for auto insurance. I don't hope for a fender bender on the way home. 
I still pay my auto insurance. I got the high sign that says our time is up. Um, I'll be here for a little period of time afterward, but uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>